Hello, welcome everyone. Give you a moment to connect to audio and file in. This is the Brooklyn Rails 630th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the extreme pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Sheila Hicks and Toby Camps. And we're thrilled to welcome poet Marta Nunez Pulsos here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on uh, Excuse me. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenape, Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. After studying painting at Yale University, Sheila Hicks began weaving and producing fabrics in Central and South America in the early 1960s. Attracted to her hand-woven aesthetic, Knoll International collaborated with Hicks in 1966 to produce Inca. The woven upholstery design proved highly successful worldwide and has been revived many times since its original introduction. Choosing to remain on the periphery of the mainstream art world, Hicks has consistently blurred the lines between art, craft, and design. Her work has been shown across the globe and is in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and others. Our host today is Toby Camps, who is former director of Blaffer Museum of Art and curator of modern and contemporary art at the Manil Collection. He is now the Director of External Projects at White Cube Gallery and is an editor at large for The Rail. Thank you all so much for being here today with us and I'll turn it over to you, Toby. Great, hi everybody. Hi, Sheila, thank you for, for joining us. Um, we, uh, this is a, a great honor for me too. Um, and you'll see today that we have lots and lots of images from Sheila Hicks's show off grid at the Hepworth Wakefield Gallery in Wakefield, England. And I went there the week before last and I was telling the curator, Andrew Bonacina this morning that it realigned my art chakras. Um, this exhibition is, uh, first of all, it's just kind of bowls you over the invention, the um, saturated colors of all the works. And then it is beautifully, beautifully choreographed. There's a sense of surprise around every corner. and. I I hope we can, since we'll be showing so many images this, Sheila, I hope we can talk a little bit about your, your show. And Andrew also gave me a couple of good questions to ask you. Um, but I want to start with the simplest possible question. And that is, how do you describe what it is you do? I describe um, by using a kind of theatrical, uh, seductive voice and say, Come along and take a look. And I'll take it from there because uh, some people will take a look and just walk out into the other room. And some people will stop and really take a look. And it sounds to me that's what you did the other day. So it's a pleasure to talk to you because um, I'm willing to go to the second degree and say. Uh, Great. What I'm doing um, is working with uh, materials, light, space, and reacting to an environment and taking into account for whom I'm working, who is the public. Is it um, is it in France? Is it in uh, Chile? Is it in Mexico? Is it in uh, China? I think of my potential audience and try to move it in a way that they're not going to depend on having to read all of the text, oftentimes translated and not always translated very well. Do they have to read the text in order to understand what they're looking at? I try to gear it that 
someone I'm respectful of texts and of people trying to to tell me and others what I'm doing but at the same time I think I have to pitch it in a way that it doesn't depend on text that it can be discovered and um, imagined and processed even without the captions or le le or legends legend I don't know if that helped. It did. I, I spent a lot of time reading the texts and was, um, this is, I think, the first time that you've shown your photographs with your work, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And there, so there's a sense of context built there. And you have some mental maps, drawings, or I guess sort of word maps that you've made talk about the places you've worked and so i there's a sense of your origin story coming through there um and i, I hope we could talk about exhibition making too later but um you know one thing that that came through was your time at yale we you started there in 1954 you were there until 1957 when you got a fellowship and then you return there, you've got both your MFA and your BFA from Yale, but could you talk about your time there and especially with some of the professors you worked with who are quite illustrious and, and um, gave you um, some, some pushes in certain exciting directions, I think it's fair to say. And it'd be great to talk a little bit about that time because I believe the Bauhaus influence was still strong then at that time. You're alluding to Albers, of course. To Talking to Albers, but then also uh, George Kubler, that we talked about a little bit last week. We didn't have much to do with the Bauhaus. Kubler and the Bauhaus. No, no but no, <laughs> but but he 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 sent you to Peru. Was, um, if I'm not mistaken. He was a pre-Columbian art historian in the uh, art history department and um, we were blind in uh, in the period that i was at yale they uh, tried to educate this art students and in, and teach them how to read and write as well as uh, create art and so they obliged us it was obligatory to take uh, art history courses and write term papers every year in different areas of research and the um so i did with um or you know far eastern art uh, middle eastern art uh, i've when i took the one from um, pre-columbian art that's how i ran across george kubler and uh, at the same time i was studying with albers Kubler said we had to all write, I'll be, I'll try and be simple. We had to write term papers about some subject, given subject. He flashed continually on the screen as he lectured incredible images. Some of them were of mummy bundles, wrapped mummies in, tech, in woven textiles. I took the decision to write about those rather than about the architecture. Many of the others in the class were writing about uh, Machu Picchu or uh, about ceramics or about things. And I went to the library to check out a book about this by Darcourt, Frenchman. I waited and waited to try and get the book so I could write in a better and more informed way. But guess who had checked the book out and hadn't brought it back? It was a faculty wife, Annie Albers, Joseph Albers' wife. So now we're into the Bauhaus. They, as you know, came to the United States, Second World War period, taught in Black Mountain. And then Albers came up to Yale. I mean, they came, both of them, up to New Haven. And Albers was hired to teach at the Yale Art School. 
not Annie. Annie was home with this René Raoul de Arcourt book on pre-Columbian textiles and weaving. I couldn't get the book. Um, Albert saw me, this, this, is, this is folkloric, but it's quite telling. He saw me struggling to try and myself figure out what weaving was. So I took my painting stretchers and wrapped threads around them and poked other threads inside and tried to find linear structures connecting and allowing diagonals as well as horizontals and verticals. And Albert said to me, um, was is das, girl? He spoke English in a, with a German accent. Was is das, girl? That was my name, girl. Um, Thursday, go downstairs to the office. I'm taking you home to meet my wife. And the man painting next to me, and he's still alive, Ernest Boyer in Dayton, Ohio. He was my protector in this school. Turned to me and said, when Albers left, Sheila, you don't go home with your teeth, with your professor. You don't go home with your professor. And I said, uh, well, wisdom. This guy was smart. He was trying to save me from the worst possible fate. But the following week, when I was due to go down to the office and report, I took the big risk. And maybe it's one of the biggest risks I've taken in my life. I went down and Albers drove me to his house and he told me to bring those things that I was making with me and I showed them to his wife at his house in North Haven, Connecticut. She spoke English better and she would say things like, hmm, the tension is important. Maybe." I can show you how to make the lisier, the edges less wobbly so that they line up correctly. She was putting me on a track of trying to figure out how to do things the right way. Well, of course, all of the wrong ways and the haphazard and voyage of discovery was what was appealing to me because I was still carrying these images of the mummy bundles that Kubler had projected in my visual memory. And so I was being very playful. And there I was at the bus stop, waiting for the bus to get back from North Haven, Connecticut in the rain, thinking, how did I get myself into this? Now I'm in a terrific dilemma. How am I going to find my way through the discipline, the knowledge, and the guidance that they're offering me generously and find my own voice in amongst the grand land of confusion. Excuse me for being so lengthy, but I think I've told you quite a bit of the foundation of where I've come from and it's the basis of where I continue to work in the unknown area and with the materials that allow for threads moving and crossing and moving around in space in three dimensions, often not knowing when I begin how it's going to end, and even inviting public participation, often in exhibitions, to touch, move, and alter, and, and find alternatives to my suggestions, and to improve upon them, and they often do. You were doing that maybe in that show last week. Toby, did you move anything? I, I did not. I'm a trained museum guy, so I kept my hands to myself. I was tempted. I also wanted to take a running leap onto one of the works. We can talk about that later uh, and just feel it. Um, Sheila, can you tell us just quickly what these mummy bundles look like? I'm very, very curious 
uh, to hear, I'm, what do they look like? They look like what that you see in the photograph there in the corner? On the floor? Yes. They're, yes. they're wrapped mounds. And there, there so, might, so be, there thick might, be, and... uh, might be a whole tribe wrapped in there. And to some, some almost have like a package wrapping aspect. There's a very thin cord over other cords, as if um, some uh, they were being culture, packed some up. Some cultures and societies do not um, wrap their memories or, or loved ones in, or put them in boxes um, or incinerate them. Some of them carefully envelop them. And that's what I found was going on in the Altiplano in Peru, and even today. And, and you, you, but it was, it was Joseph Albers, I believe, who got you the, the Fulbright Fellowship to go to Chile. Is that, am I getting well, that straight? He, being German, you, you wonder if he had a sense of humor. Um, I'm sorry to say, because... He did have a sense of humor because when he sent me down to the office that spring and told me to sign some papers he'd prepared, I did go down and it said he was sending me to Chile to teach his course, two and three dimensional design and color, to the young architecture students at the Universidad Católica in Santiago. Uh, I swallowed and thought, I can do that, I know how to teach what I just learned. I mean, can rerun it through. But where in the world is Chile? I remember going to the library to find it in an atlas. Um, and that really scared, that scared me. I thought it looked so far down that how am I going to get back from there? But I went and thank God I did because I went first to Venezuela with an architecture student who was one, who was a Louis Kahn architecture student from Yale. And together we went to Venezuela. And from there I continued on alone, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile. Did the, what I was told to do by my German professor and reported back to him what I was doing. And then headed back up after going down to Punta Arenas in Tierra del Fuego with the Chilean photographer Sergio Larraín, his father was the dean of the architecture school. And then heading back up and we made exhibition, he and I, of his photographs and my paintings in the Museo de Bellas Artes in Santiago and then over in Argentina, Buenos Aires. I continued up through Brazil back to Venezuela and reported for duty to do the masters at Yale. That's a quick biographical sketch. And from painting then, I was sent by the French professor, Henri Père, who gave me a grant to come to France. I've been in France since, well, I've had a few other things in between, but I've actually had a residence and lived in France and worked since 1965. Was there a definitive moment where you moved from being a painter to something else, or do you always see these boundaries as kind of fluid? I see them totally uh, sense, totally senseless. They don't make any sense. Painters are painting on woven canvas. They're painting on woven linen most of the time, or Matisse. I mean, you put your hand down on a on a canvas and you're already in the world of weaving. Then you cover it over with some uh, glue or uh, prep and then you put another layer on top. And if the artists today, the young artists today, who are completely open-minded, may do another layer and go back again and start to cut into and collage and build upon the second surface, the third surface, the fourth surface, and they may be using any one of a number of different kinds of materials. 
So, you know, these barriers, I think, are reserved for archivists who are, and for conservationists who have to conserve things in museums in terms of um, how to treat them and how to uh, preserve them. Some people make things out of... I once remember at a conference in the Getty, there was someone who was lecturing and she her work was all made out of fresh fruit and vegetables. And I was wondering how they were going to conserve that. And it was fibrous because as they started to dry out and dehydrate and things, the, the fibers became more and more apparent. I'm mixing things up, but excuse me. No, please. I, th I think that that's the sense of the show. I mean, I, I was very taken, as I mentioned at the beginning, by your photographs. You, your photographs of Machu Picchu illustrated some articles by your professor. They were extraordinary. And I think that I'm assuming that that was a little bit of that Bauhaus training where the camera is a kind of notebook. Um, uh, but you, you know, you, you and I spoke about travel and you've worked all around the world, South Africa, India, uh, Chile, you lived in Mexico for an extended period, it looked like four or five years. And um, you were, in, you know, it worked in India. Um, now you weren't, as you said, you, you weren't traveling for the sake of traveling, you were going where you were invited, or you had something to do. But can you talk about how you met fiber artists and weavers on these travels and how you communicated and what you what that dialogue was like? You choose any of these countries. <laughs> Sorry to list so many. When you um, walk out into uh, a new environment and you're hungry, you look at where the market is. I mean, you look at the restaurants and the street vendors and things, but you end up in the market and you look, start looking and thinking, what are people eating here? And how are they preparing their nourishment, their food? The next thing you look at is how are they keeping warm or what are they wearing? How are they enveloping and protecting themselves? So any time I've been in a walking out of a hotel or a, men, a pension or anything like that. I'll walk in, oftentimes, if I can, right away into the market and sort of figure out from the basics, the food and the, um, and the fiber and the textiles and the things that help people to protect themselves and turn into and become and present themselves as the person they want to be perceived as because tattoos come into the game, of course, a lot, a lot now. But um, otherwise, you do look at how people turn themselves out, what they grab in their closet to put on every morning and to tell you who they are and to tell you what they give value to. So that's been very important to me in working around the world. And it's an international language when you sit down and look at how things are made and then find the people who are making them, whether it be individuals or in factories or in spinning or other chemical treating plants that are producing synthetic fibers. When you start seeing how all these things are made, it becomes, you don't even need to ask questions. You don't need to even verbalize. You just watch and you learn all kinds of fascinating things from the whole world of textile and thread and fiber culture. A Andrew Bonacina, I asked him why the show was called Off Grid. And he said, well, um, this is an artist who learned how to weave and then broke out of the frame and went off grid. And it sounds like you were, I mean, off of the weaving grid, but also off of the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, it, traversing the boundaries of contemporary art and working with indigenous weavers. Um, he also said too, back to the idea of blurring distinctions that you were 
early in your career, you were selling works to MoMA while you were designing textiles for Florence Knoll. And the thing I love too, is that you wore a dress that you had adapted from a Yugoslavian potato sack for your interview with Florence Knoll, um, just to show, you know, the, 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 uh, the, it's, it's that thoroughgoing your engagement with, with textile. So that's, you know, I think kind of a unique figure. And at one point you designed something for Air France, you were working with magazine design and, and collaborating with architects too. And is that, how do you, is that just yes. that you don't see the distinctions right. or how do you encompass all these worlds? Um, I'm going to back up for Air France one second. When the first Boeing 747s came into existence and each of the airlines, major airlines, presented their initial 747 Boeing, they each decorated their planes in a way that were appealing and they used graphic designers and uh, interior designers and things. And I was contacted in Paris by a woman who was in the competition to do the interior of the first Boeing 747 for Air France. And she asked me to make something that was a, a thing that could be on the um, interior of the plane that was semi, you know, half, half circle. And I invented a panel of stitching using what I call gros point instead of petit point. Petit point, do you say in English? I took uh, canvas and uh, raw silk because it was not highly flammable. It was more self-extinguishing fiber, which is important for the airlines. And I made a panel. She won the contest of doing the Air France 747s. Well, all the ones we had in our studio in order for four panels, these are worth. Could I please keep making these? And I said, I'm not gonna repeat and do the same thing over and over again. And no one else in my studio will either. They'll all walk out. And so we made all different versions, but using the same basic materials and grid. And each time went off grid into different directions. We ended up doing a whole large, well, this is the reason I'm telling you is because a good idea somehow perpetuates itself. They kept ordering these for me, and since I said I couldn't keep doing these, I went to the Couvent Carmelite, the Carmelite convent in Boulogne, which is a silent order where the nuns work in silence. And I showed them what I was up against. And they said, can we help? Because we're going bankrupt because nobody's ordering the little wafers that people take for communion that always were stamped with the diocese, with the diocese. They're just taking plain wafers and they don't want us to keep stamping these little wafers and we're trying to think of an income source. I said, well, does this look like one? Of course. And they started helping me make, can you imagine the absurdity of the Carmelite, Carmelite nun? And they said, this is like being, none of them had ever taken a plane, by the way. Sir Colette, who was head of the convent, not a single person in, in that period had ever taken a plane. And here they were stitching the Boeing 747 bas reliefs. And they said it was like being in, this, in the Jonah and the whale. They were inside the whale's belly. <laughs> we were doing the decor. I thought that was so beautiful. But the one thing leads to another, you see. And those kept kept on and kept on and kept on because Air France at one point decided enough and then they got complaints from their first class passengers who were booking their flights and they said, where's that nice thing that you used to have in the <laughs> That's why we kept the Couvent in Carmelite and Boulogne in business for quite a while through that little bridge, cultural bridge. But I'm sorry to mixing up its story with your biographical mode. No, please, this is, this is, this is, um, this is what I was getting at, is that you've um, done many, many interesting things and that the flow too is both 
you went to the Carmelite nuns, you took ideas and materials out of the studio, but <clears throat> you and I were speaking and just by coincidence, we have La Mer here, which is this, <clears throat> actually, no, I think it's the, the hanging silk cords that the artist Barbara Chase Rabu, the sculptor who I'm a big fan of, also a writer, she came to the studio and saw these silk cords. It was a kind of a solution for some bronze sculptures that she was making. And you shared this technique and this material with her and other artists have, have come to the studio too and left with uh, some of your ideas too. Uh, we're in the hundreds now. We're not in the dozens. We used to say a few artists have come to see us or a few artisans or a few craftsmen or a few designers. But we're way up in the hundreds now, you know, because we've got a studio running in Paris since 1965, 66, when we did the Ford Foundation. See that panel in the background on the right? That was one of the samples for the Ford Foundation in New York. Um, you're in Brooklyn, and so it's not so far. You can go over, it's there hanging in the boardroom and in the uh, auditorium. It's about 1,300 of these moving medallion discs that are in silk stitched onto a linen so it's a bas relief acoustically perfect for a boardroom and for an auditorium now people would be keep coming into our studio all the time and we'd be making things and each one would walk out and do another version and bring sometimes come back or show it or send us photographs or whatever. and uh, it's so gratifying when you have an echo like that some people would say, no, you shouldn't let people in because they're going to be influenced. I mean, what is the point? If you're doing something you love and you think is valid, let's share it. There's no such thing as knockoffs or copies or impressions of other people's work. So share whatever you can. I think it's, it's, it's the way to go. It's, we share. That's what this whole um, Zoom or internet world that we're living in now is, is a very big sharing world. Well, we're, we're grateful that you're, you're sharing your thoughts with us too. And I forgot to mention too, that there is a large scale public art installation that will be up until October when Freeze the Freeze Art Fair starts in London. It's at, at King's Cross. Uh, and it's a, it's a, a, the closest I can think of, it's nothing like it, but it's like camouflage netting over coal drop yards. I mean, it's a sort of screen with um, flying strips of fabric. And um, I'm just, I'm just bringing that in, but. Like this going over cables, coming and going. Yeah. Over cables. Mm -hmm. Um, but if Andrew you, Bonaccina, the curator of Off Grid. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, um, people go and roller skate or skateboard or or picnic or have concerts or hang out at night. I mean, at King's Cross, you know what it's like. This vast, big public space, and this is a this is sort of like a ribbon canopy that's running and trembles when when it when it rains or when there's wind. And it doesn't tremble in a menacing way. It trembles in a kind of um, intriguing, moving way, like a dolphin jumps. And so I hear people telling me they go back repeatedly just to relax there. The shadows look so soothing. There's a fantastic photo of you with these dancing shadows, like a school of fish in shadow form and you're standing in it. Um, that will be my first stop when I'm back in London. Um, Andrew Bonacina said that, that collaboration, as we were just talking about, this is the heart of your practice, whether it's with indigenous weavers in the south of India, um, or in the case of the Hepworth Wakefield with the architect, David Chipperfield, he said that you kind of he said you were the first artist who didn't want to build a lot of walls in this space. Um, can you talk about that we didn't collaboration any. with with the architect in a building? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what he said, and he he was absolutely surprised because most artists would want to have walls built. Well, panels or whatever they have, maybe intimate works or something, and they think that you have a better viewing if you get 
the public up towards a wall that um, you that have the proximity close. But I liked the idea of walking into that very beautiful architecture where the light sources are coming from all different directions and different openings in the ceiling. Uh, and I liked just taking the space and working within the space. You see in this photograph we're looking at, there's a prayer rug up on the wall. How is it lit? It's lit from natural daylight from a clear story that's up above on the left-hand side. And we tried not to use, we tried to use as few spotlights and as few electric lights as possible. And to just, and I, it's unusual for textiles because all the conservators will tell you they have to have a certain light level for textiles to preserve them. But I found some producers of fibers and fabrics where the things are um, resistant to light, sun, and water. And that, so sky's the limit. We can keep making things in natural spaces with natural light, indoors and outdoors. We've gone out in the garden there at the Hepworth and made things also out in the garden. So you, you liked the, the light. Um, and Andrew asked me, Andrew Bonacina asked me to, to ask you about exhibition making. By now you've had shows all around the world. You've been at the Venice Biennale, the Whitney Biennial, the Sao Paulo Biennale. Um, what do you do when somebody comes to you with a floor plan and says, would you like to do something there? How do you start to think through that project? We look at, we, we look, look, we have now Zoom, you know, we look at the space, we walk through the space as though a real person is walking and navigating in space. It's not like the architect sitting on computers and just looking at floor plans. And also, send someone in with a camera before breakfast, after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, and see how those spaces are changing too. And think of things that, that could be enhanced by the fact that they could be changing. They're not constantly lit the same way or constantly presented the same way because you can go to the, there are museums that are open at night and then there are days when they have children streaming through by the hundreds and they can run around and they can uh, play games within the spaces. So why build all these walls that when you can just give them wonderful opportunities for moving in the space? We have a big... Well, I saw that in action. I saw that in action in the north of England. People talk and they were all uh, having a good, a good time in the show. And some children too were moving through it. Um, uh, I was, you know, I'd love to know how you start to develop an idea. How does, how does a work come to you? And, and well, I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it there. I'd love to know how you, you develop an idea. I close my eyes. I close my eyes and I dream. And then when I open my eyes, I think, now how am I going to do that? Or how could that happen? <laughs> how could we make it happen? But most of my ideas, whether they're good or bad, or not so good, but sort of on the way to, to almost be almost be something, if we could just crystallize and fit it out and work it through, come by closing the eyes and dreaming. Sounds easy, doesn't it? So anybody can do it. anybody can do it. You can sit on a train. Do you lie on a couch? Do you how do you, how you do you sit, on a train. You sit in a chair? How do you how do you do this? You take your you have an important on a train? meeting. No, you have an important meeting with the president of who knows what. And he's up on the 14th floor, so you take an elevator and as you're going to the meeting, you close your eyes. And you think before you go in the meeting. And you listen to what your eyes are telling you with closed of what you might really imagine doing. You wouldn't start a day or two earlier rather than in the elevator on the way to the meeting? 
Wait, the best ideas come when you're under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, we saw we saw the big Moroccan prayer rug, which for me was just glorious. And it was this, you know, we talked a little about Ellsworth Kelly, you know, one of these perfect arcs in a, go in a darker gold. I think that's slide number 10, yes. Um, and then there, and I think of, you know, lingams or something there, but also an entrance to a temple or something. Um, you know, I'd love to hear about the origin of a work like that, but also the minims, which are quite, quite small. You, you work on a very, very intimate sc scale as often as you do on this very large scale. Some are a hundred meters long, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the Can you talk Fuji about those, those? In Japan, we made, um, yeah. in Japan, we made a panel that's a bar relief 103 meters, 330 feet or more, long as a bar relief of frieze in the whole lobby of, um, of the Cultural Institute that had three auditoriums. And for people, we did it in a way that we thought it through with the architects to be able to help the people know which salle to go into when they came out in the intermission of the uh, whatever kabuki or theater or or opera that was, they were attending, they'd come out in the intermissions. How do they find their way back in the right salle in the right place in the right area? So we made a huge bar relief that that developed in a color, a one color sense from one end to the other, and they tickets that they had when they bought entrance had a prominent color on it, and they would not lose their way. They'd know that that is the way, find the sal that seems to be indicated that way. It's an idea that I'd already done in Mecca at the, U, in, at the United Arab Conference League, where the doors, we hung prayer rugs over the doors in the different sections that it colors, so that when people left the room or had intermission or or coming in and out, they could find their seating and orientation by these color coatings, which textiles lend themselves to so simply and so easily. How did I get into that? It was because well, that, that was the one loan that, that you said you guys, you and Andrew could not get for the off-grid exhibition. They wouldn't lend that. But you've got many, many works which are on permanent view. Um, and I believe this Moroccan prayer rug was one of them, if I'm not mistaken. But you've got some really, really terrific, hard to get loans um, but, but uh, of grand works. But then I, want, I, I would love to talk about these minims. I think it's the... Uh, what are they? Yeah, I think it's the curator who got the loans because he was so tenacious. And he had all that time with COVID in, that intervened. So he had twice as much time as most curators who are desperate to try and get their loans. Um, he managed to take advantage that it was COVID and he followed through in a very obstinate way and managed to get some important loans. But you were down into the Minim story, which is the size of a piece of paper, a eight by 10 piece of paper. Well, those is, it's a little frame that I have that I travel in and I've had all my life. And I just, I just meditate and work on that little frame, that little stretcher frame and put whatever I happen to find that day or have in, stuffed in the closet for a rainy day or even something that I invent by taking and shredding something that I no longer want to wear and thinking of, of uh, thinking, just meditating, thinking and working with my hands and ignoring the telephone and ignoring People come in and asking questions, and I just say, figure it out, talk to you later. And I sit quietly and work on little <laughs> little messages. I call them minims because they're it's sort of a French way of saying little, small thing, instead of saying miniature, a minim, huh? Minimal, huh? There's That's something. That's good. 
I, I had, I confess, I had to Google it and it said minor, but I didn't think these were minor works. It's all right. At all. But it, it could fit in because, because, <clears throat> I don't know, Paul Clay did a lot of meanings. I don't know if they're minor. But, you know, Paul Clay worked in this size. Mm -hmm. So did Julius Bizier. Some of the... Who's that? He's a great, he was a great artist. I did, um, at the last Paris Art Fair, um, the gallery asked me which artist was my favorite artist that I wanted to show with, to, to, to put two artists together in the art fair. And I said, Julius Bizier. You can Google him. You'll find somebody wonderful. He's no longer with us. But, I mean, his work, was so, his work was so minimal and yet so um, playful. Could could the rail team maybe pull up a Bizier work just to, to flash it on screen? And, and maybe while they're doing that too, I was reading about this, but you made one minim at a tire company in Japan. Well, using stainless steel um, ca cable that they, you know, tires, um, tire manufacturers um, use stainless steel in the tires to, to reinforce them. And when I was working on a stage curtain in um, Kiryu in Japan, um, we're, I was looking for a place and material and some kind of idea for the stage curtain. And since, since the idea of inflammability was important, in the future, um, when I went to a laboratory to see experimentation, I saw the Bridgestone Tire Company using uh, stainless steel fibers and and somehow twisting them, and they could all become kind of like a weavable thread somehow, cable to turn a uh, torsade. Just um, so I used it in the small works, and most of my Small works are so small that they really are self-contained. So they have four salvages, which is the difference between we, what most weavers are doing. Most weavers are weaving on some kind of loom, and at a certain point, they whip out a scissors and cut it off. I never do that. In fact, I don't even own a scissors because it's to me, <laughs> it's to me um, discipline and interdiscipline of a thought like a poem that has a beginning, middle, and end, and doesn't get truncated by computers dropping in and dropping out whole phrases and blacking out the original and initial force of the impetus of the idea. So it's a complete piece in itself, usually. What I call four, in French is four, it's quatre lisières, so it's four salvages. And usually the works that I work on are rather interesting, not only front but back. And if you go out for lunch and come back and left it on the table and come in the other door, maybe it's even as interesting upside down as it was the other way. So I'm toying and playing and and uh, like photographers do in the dark room, moving the object around and looking at it from all the different angles. And then since it's pliable, if it's fiber and textile, and you take it and just grab it by the corner and hang it up in the corner, come back tomorrow, and you'll see how it's starting to move on its own, according to the humidity. Uh, there's a Bézier. You can probably see why I like that one. Yeah. Just this, this, um... This, these uh, metallic fibers that you made at the, ter the, t the Bridgestone Tire Company, they are in the most amazing colors, sort of greens to reddish, orangish colors. And I said, oh, that's, you know, and you pushed the tire company to give these wires those colors. Is that correct? None, none of them are dyed. That's the secret. Yeah. None of them are dyed. The color is produced by a heating and cooling process by running the fibers through intense heat and then through cooling temperatures and water. And so you can never repeat the same thing twice. 
it'll atmospherically turn and, be, and, and, and acquire a color, and it's permanent. Anyway, imagine how much fun to find those fibers and start playing with those. Yeah. Um, well, we, we're way, getting to the question. Here, the, but oh. the sad, sad part of that story, because every story doesn't have a happy ending. I, the architect said I couldn't use that fiber in the stage curtain, what they call it, a doncho, um, because it's a curtain that comes on the stage from above and comes down. And the steel fiber had a, a weight that would threaten, be threatening, if anything would ever happen in the, in the control system of raising and lowering this curtain, because if it would come and crash, we might lose quite a few citizens. And so <laughs> they didn't accept my designed for the stage curtain out of the stainless steel thread. Mm. But I had to do it in another kind of synthetic, more lightweight, inflammable material that wouldn't kill anyone. So, um, I, I would love to, before we go to question and answers, maybe wrap up with the discussion of materials. You've used absolutely raw materials, I think, wool straight from the sheep with lanolin and the barnyard uh, funk to it to um, things that are, I guess you'd call them manufactured materials. Um, these tire wires and, and, and yarns and things. But then um, in this exhibition, there are several works made from what I would call found objects and they're French nurses uniforms, or it seems like you've taken the, the plackets and the cuffs and then also a series of like little cotton pouches that you would put your belongings in if you, when you checked into a, a hospital. And can you, you know, to me, these bring associations and, and a kind of aura that maybe is uniquely human, you know, and, and the, in the medical context, do you, how do you, what's it like using, pulling found materials that have this history with them into your work. And the idea occurs to me for the first time while I'm talking, while you're speaking, I was thinking when, when I got to Chile in 1957, and I rented an empty store as a place to live and work, a little empty storefront in front of Parque Forestal, and I didn't have any furniture, but I went to the market and I got a straw mimbre, table and chair, and then a mattress. And then I took my suitcase and I took my clothes out and I hung it on the walls to keep me company in the space so I wouldn't be alone in the space. Because I was gonna start painting and I thought as I go along, I'll be painting, I'll be drawing, I'll be hanging things on the wall, but for the moment, who's here to keep me company? And so I hung all the things in my suitcase around and made a collage on the wall and that's uh, when you're speaking about materials, found objects and things like that. I often tell um, young artists and things or students, uh, if you invite me over for lunch, let's look at your closet. Now take everything out and put it in the middle of the room and show me where you're gonna use and what you're gonna use to make art. And shoelaces and house slippers and lost belts from things that no longer exist and half sweaters that are full of moth holes and things like this. You can stuff the holes and put other things in the holes. I, and you can make the most amazing things out of found objects. Um, well now you, if, and then stuff them all back in a sack and take them with you and make an exhibition because you don't need a crate and insurance and the expense when someone says I really didn't make a show, but I mean, we haven't got any budget. What's the budget you need if you just bring it in a sack? And if you just hang it on the wall and you compose it like the Bizier painting I just showed you, or you showed me, excuse me, 
and start to move it and then think in space. If you can do it on the wall, you can do it in space. And then you can refine it and you can even convince some innocent so-called client or museum or curator to take it seriously enough and say, oh, this would be nice. We could put this in an art exhibition and nobody's gonna know the difference. I'm not trying to fool anyone. I'm just saying found objects can be very inspirational and real. So I tend to not only have to special order very expensive materials, you know, of, uh, I won't name any of the artists because I have to be kind to my colleagues, but a lot of them are spending a big, big, big amount of money, budgets, on fabrication and materials. And the idea is a very cheap idea, but it looks great because it's in all of these very expensive materials. And the collector's convinced that it's really worth all that money because look how it shines. And look how it, <laughs> I'm being facetious, I'm sorry, but I'm, a, I'm attracted somehow to humble materials. The humble materials have maybe sometimes great secrets. I love it. Well, can we open up um, the, to, to the questions from the audience? And I do have to say that I think I don't own a pair of scissors is um, hugely inspirational to me that that's um, the last thing I'd expect you to say. I would just assume that it was a matter of course that of course you would have a pair of scissors, but I, I that sort of opened the top of my head up in a, in a great way. So thank you for sharing that. But let's have some questions from the audience, please. Great. Well, thank you both so, so much. Um, this is really incredible. We are going to turn it over to our friend GE first. Um, go ahead. GE and Amir to ask. Thank you, Chloe. Thank mm -hmm. you, Toby. And thank you, Ms. Hicks, so much for being here today. I feel so honored to, to just hang out here. The question is. Can you talk a little bit about how being rebellious against things like tristesse and against states of melancholy and against devastations has been essential to your creative work in life? Thank you. Wait a minute, there's a very sad note there. You'd like me to talk about how tragic and horrific experiences have contributed to uh... not necessarily but some devastations and perhaps some some kind of senses of melancholy that you that you've been rebellious against and that rebellion has then gone forward to shape your your work and your life but sometimes i make things that are very intentionally very very sad like take um all these military uniforms like I did in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, from the stock where they'd been all washed and just stacked because they were from no longer no longer usable in the military and just hang them up as a whole mass of military uniforms connected and coming from the cell out through the window into the courtyard. Because I was watching how as you go from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv to the airport, practically every village, every place had military uniforms hanging out on the clotheslines, drying over the weekend, especially when people would come home for the weekend and their mothers would, or they would throw things in the washing machine, dry them, put them on the clotheslines, you'd see them everywhere. And this, um, I don't know if, if melancholy is the right way to express this, but the idea of of um, reality and tragedy and conflict and sadness that these textiles cause you to remember and think about, I felt needed to be expressed as well, not just making fun and games, not just making colorful, um, elegant decoration, 
but to use the textiles as part of an extension of our gamut, the humic gamut of of experience. Does that answer you at all? Oh, yes, it does so very much. And I, I thank you, yes, because it, it seems that you just take it in so many different directions and it's wonderful. Thank you, GE, for your question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask a question on the behalf of Marie Birkadal. Um, she is wondering in the end, or sorry, <laughs> what are um, your, Sheila's, favorite authors um, or novels or a most influential book? To, to take her name and number and I'll write on tonight I'll think about this because it's 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 something I don't want to say off the top of my head yeah sure sure that yeah, can be a big question huh? um let's see uh Kathleen let me just put one in the chat I can unmute you Kathleen if you're available to ask it okay be able to unmute Yes, I'd like to ask Ms. Hicks how she's dealt with the uh, perennial craft versus art argument. What's the argument? I mean, anybody... uh, the argument is that one is better than the other. Well, does a painter, that... how does the painter get the paint on the on on the canvas? Well, it's a social, it's been an issue in the art market, for example, uh, particularly to do with how hands-on your process is, how close the artist is to the actual fabrication of the work itself. And uh, part of the definition of craft has been that a number of people can do it and that it isn't all that hard. I mean, this is, that's been, that has been the blockade from craft being seen in art galleries more commonly. It's a little more complex than that because okay. uh, it's a little more complex because there's all kinds of art. There's all kinds of crafts. There are all kinds of level of excellence, ingenuity, creativity in any of those things. So for people to make categories and hierarchies, you have to think about how does this, whatever you're looking at, don't call it art, craft, performance, or in, think about it in terms of, does this touch me or does it touch the person next to me who's very different from me? Just because it touches me doesn't mean it's going to touch the next person. So watch and see how it touches the next person and think it through and realize who cares how it's made. What they care about is, does it have a message or a way or a presence that touches you or the person who is not even like you? And then people who are writing or publishing magazines or articles and things, um, let them find new vocabularies, new words, new adjectives, new theories, and, and encourage them to keep arguing, because if they can keep arguing about all these boundaries, it keeps the whole thing vital and alive. Photographers, are they artists or not? You know, the photographers, keep it alive. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm going to let uh, Chloe ask. Yeah, the last question comes from our artistic director and publisher, Fong Bui, um, who is not here yet. He was here earlier in the conversation, but had to go. And so I'm going to ask on his behalf, Sheila. Um, the question is, one of the wonderful attributes of your work, however large or small in scale, is that each artwork possesses a sense of imminent aura and poetic warmth akin to the paintings of Paul Klee, who you'd mentioned today. 
What are your thoughts on mediating or contemplating scale? And how do you describe your sense of scale in relation to music or to rhythm? Um, which Fong feels so deeply every time he confronts your work. He's, he hears sounds when he confronts my work? Yeah. With his eyes open or closed? <laughs> he didn't tell me that part, so we don't know. <laughs> um, I like it when there are sounds like, uh, uh, you know, at this Hepworth show, the museum in Wakefield, there are sometimes school groups that come through and I'm in another room and they come galloping through 20, 30 kids all at once. Um, and they give the show a different sound. Mm -hmm. And then um, there are these guides who come through and they give lectures and, and tell people how to look at things or tell people what they are looking at, you know, try to enhance and get them to look. And depends on the tonality of the voice. I'm listening to your voice today. I'm listening to Carolyn's voice today, Caroline. And I'm listening to tonalities of voices. And I think when I see images, and if someone's standing next to me, talking, two or three people visiting simultaneously when I'm in a place like the Museum of Modern Art or someplace, which is always crowded, so you can never really get away and be alone with the art. You're always hearing voices, conversations, and um, people shouting to try and find lost stray children or something. Um, so he's probably talking about music and he's talking about drumming maybe, or uh, percussion, or did he give an indication? No. Um, it's funny you say drums because I thought strings, Sheila. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then of course in theater, you know, in every theater there are textiles happening mm -hmm. and there is sound and, re and acoustical properties interacting between the curtains, the cushions, the people, how many people are in the room, or in these very big concerts, mm -hmm. the sounds and the way people are dressed. Is it summer and it's just skin and bones with a halter and a, and a bikini? Or is it winter concerts in closed halls where it's very, very deep sounds because of the textiles, because of all the velvet, mm -hmm. all of the rugs, and all of the winter coats that people have and scarves and things and the whole sound changes in the at least in the opera house here in paris ask him uh, I'll, I'll i'll i'd be happy to have a conversation with him thank you for that answer <laughs> thank you Sheila. um thank you again Sheila and toby so much for this conversation um we have a tradition at the rail of ending our events with a poetry reading. And I'm so thrilled to welcome Marta Nunez Pizols here to close us out today. Writer and translator Marta Nunez Pizols is from the south of Spain and based in Durham, North Carolina. Together with Argentine poet Maya Morisano, she's the co author of the bilingual collection The Nombres Ciudadales from Turba. And her poems can be found in. La Bella Varsovia, Dayton Drum, Holographica, and Dreginald. She co curates the reading series Paradiso in Chapel Hill. Welcome, Marta, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Sheila, for your wonderful work and for offering that, um, those insightful reflect reflections and Humble materials have great secrets. I think I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. And I do think that uh, it can be translated into poetry too. Um, thank you so much, Caroline and Toby and Chloe for facilitating this conversation and um, for creating this space um, for us to be able to learn and to be stimulated and to share. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to be reading from this manuscript that is called The Giant Squid. And the manuscript is about grief. Um, and it's about grief in its very manifold iterations or in its different dimensions. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start. Crowning of the Weeping Bride. These antlers won't stop growing into the sky. They ramify, mirroring roots as below. They become capillaries of night, spurred signature, alveolar packed, so within. This tower is a library in flames, it is your spine. Each vertebra, a different discipline, crumbling as without. Your clueless daughter, as innocent as doves, so above. These cherubs' heads popping off a dark river, you to reach the other shore, so within. Bundle baby as shrewd as snakes, decoy baby, contracted as within. Stabbed canvas, a landscape behind the landscape, bleeding into your hands, so without, so without. The next one is called Saint Bright, Bright Saint, and it starts with a verse from the Quran. We are closer to him than his jugular vein. In our last picture, both our eyes closed. I'm smiling, mirrors up without a star. I cry you a string of ears for each of your saints bugging the earth. So drool retraces all demonic shell of big heads will. Instant spider webs, your dormant fate stakes me low, but fingernails cry up, coughing proxy seals. No letters beyond this sign, no drowned sailor left behind. Yet we laugh, you hurt me, we laugh, since cruel is so close, circle tight close. Miniature close, blood as close, as close as a thought that is not yours. Up that hill after Clive Parker's In the Hills, the Cities. So the cities went up into the hills. How long until we get there? our thousand bodies tied to each other, building a giant out of us. My whole body's a part of a single articulation, knee, elbow, powered by contact flowing among many. Heads to toes, hands to mouths, hearts to livers. Rope abounds, threading we, next of king, original king. Rope doesn't know you alive or dead. Rope doesn't care. Hell a million fires from an only flame, a million tooth, an only ache. The silence before the stomp, stomp, stomp. A prophecy is the movement that comes closer. A prophecy is binding rope like blind. Imaginations gone feral, packing finally. Do we untie or do we belong? The next poem is called Synchronic. I swell, I shrink. I swell, 
I shrink, I swell, I swell, I swell. Like a heart or a bladder, I hold on to it until I can't hold it anymore. Silent hormone siege, under throbs, stabbing dull, before acutes the most, then radiates. This is not your time. More than ever now, compulsion to armor within, stuff the membrane of speech with phrasal tokens of same. Extreme blurs on this line, drain all the interest out of sex, is saved for expertise. This is not your time, but my body yells like yours did. The organ that hurts the most is the one you had removed. Doctor said I have the thing you did, not lethal, not curable, a hereditary condition. Is this the same pain you used to feel? Can I find you in it? And I'm gonna read two more poems and that's gonna be it. This, ne this next poem is called The Bad Queen. He who buries a secret buries himself with it. A secret is a grave. Gaston Bachelard. He to the killed wife's chamber fell on the puddle, days scrubbing a small stained key. Never satisfied with the first choice you decided, waited till everyone settles you moved before the beard comes. But stain can't be removed. Keys the one bleeding. Keys learned to bleed. So when the moon is in Gemini, truth abandons her children. Stories. Joins a carnival instead. Our book has two words for blood. One for blood inside the body. One for blood outside of it. Sometimes I flesh from your flesh. Others, his master's voice. Blood rituals replace circulation with the air trees of language. Our book has fear and curiosity, chariot dogging, baby face and heels, a dancing curse. Blood controls. What's a boar's heart in a heart's box? I was changing your sheet bag and you called me Cinderella. Head and tail collapsed. Us walking among the spite of ruins. And this is the last poem that is called After the Squid. Helping the dead take their new shape is grieving. The labor of pushing them out of decay and into the bloom of what they gave us. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for your, your attention. Thank you so, so much, Marta. It's amazing. Um, what, a, what an event. Thank you endlessly, Sheila and Toby. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone also from Sakama Jenkins for helping uh, with today. Uh, we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for supporting our NSE program and making these daily conversations possible. Um, you can view today's event and our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel shortly. Um, over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events, like here in our daily NSC. And check the chat for a link to donate and please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m for a conversation on chris burden featuring alexander Gimbaze, sydney sederheim and yaya shimari we conclude with a poetry reading by vlad machabansky and you can now turn your microphones on and say hello goodbye we'll see you thank you all so so much
Thanks, Thank everyone. So much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.